This is from Benjamin F. Johnson, quoted by D. Michael Quinn in The Mormon Hierarchy, Origins of Power. The innocent Missouri females hastily took from the houses what they could carry, and among the women was one young married and apparently near her confinement, and another with small children and not a wagon, and many miles away from any of their friends. And snow had begun already, uh, had be, uh, already begun to fall, but I would in no degree let them deter me from my duty. So while others were pillaging for something to carry away, I was doing my best to protect. And he talks about more about the victims. Before noon, we had set all on fire and left upon a circuitous route towards home. Boyd Packer. Uh, okay. You seminary teachers, the mantle is far, far greater than the intellect. You know this talk. You seminary teachers and some of you institute and BYU men will be teaching the history of the church this school year. The general authority that interviewed me when I became a seminary teacher in 1975 in my interview in Vancouver, Washington, I had traveled down from uh, Yakima, where I was living. Uh, he was the gen general authority that interviewed me, Packer was. And one of the interview questions was, um, had you ever been arrested? And I said, no. And he said, should you have been? <laughs> I want to confess before the internet audience, I lied. I said, no, because I couldn't think of anything I should have been arrested for. But after the, thing, after the interview, I thought lots of stuff. Okay. <laughs> you know how we cook the facts and our memories try to make us look good? <laughs> yeah. This is an unparalleled opportunity, Packer said, in the lives of your students to increase their faith and testimony of the divinity of this work. Your objective should be that they will see the hand of the Lord in every hour and every moment of the church from its beginning till now. Translation, kids must believe in infallible prophets. I know that's true, and I'll argue with anybody who says differently because I had zone administrators on the phone tell me. Not using those same words, but using the cagey, elusive, plausible deniability rhetoric that they use to threaten you and warn you that you would better fall in line or else. This, these are the marching orders. Don't go thinking you can slide in other stuff from objective histories. We won't let you get away with it, buster. There is a temptation for the writer or the teacher of church history to want to tell everything, whether it's worthy or faith-promoting or not. Some things that are true are not very useful. <laughs> I found that to be true in my life. <laughs> that historian or scholar who delights in pointing out the weaknesses and frailties of present or past leaders, destroys faith. A destroyer of faith, particularly one within the church, and more particularly one who is employed specifically to build faith, places himself in great spiritual jeopardy. Do not spread disease germs. When is the last time you heard truth equated with disease germs? <laughs> Translation, you'll lose, and, and all of us CES guys knew it. You'll lose your job, income, family security if you don't keep quiet about embarrassing <laughs> church history. Dallin Oak said, it's one thing to depreciate a person who exercises corporate power or even government power. It's quite another thing to criticize or depreciate a person for the performance of an office to which he has been called of God. It does not matter that the criticism is true. This is another uh, loyalty is more important than honesty. He said, continuing, a different, or a, in a different place, I can't remember if that was a different place or not, a different principle applies in our church. <laughs> where the selection of leaders is based on revelation, subject to the sustaining vote of the membership. 
In our system of church government, evil speaking and criticism of leaders by members is always negative. Whether the criticism is true or not, it tends to impair the leader's influence and usefulness, and thus working against the Lord and his cause, virtually making leaders unaccountable. Boyd Kirkland, ordinary member of the church, who wrote uh, in the letters to the editor of this volume of dialogue you see here, and entitled Building the Kingdom with Total Honesty, I just brought a few extracts, it's, it's too good. He had been writing the first presidency about the Adam-God doctrine, saying, I, you, know, you keep getting up in conferences and saying that members of the church are going to be punished for believing in it or talking about it or teaching it. And you deny that Brigham Young ever taught it. So he sent him all this information. He said, he did teach it. He was being very kind and very nice, and he wasn't publicizing his letters. It was all just between the first presidency and him. Michael Watson, who was the secretary at the time to the first presidency, finally had a meeting with him. He had several meetings, but Brother Watson showed me a memo written by Brother, that would be Mark E. Peterson, to the first presidency with his recommendations as to how to respond to me. He informed them that the issues I had raised were real, that Brigham Young had indeed taught these things. They could not acknowledge this lest I would trap them into saying that this therefore meant Brigham was a false prophet, which they did not believe, of course. He therefore recommended that I be given a very circuitous response evading the issue which he, Peterson, volunteered to write. I asked Brother Watson, said Boyd Kirkland, Kirtland, Kirkland, as well as members of the committee I had previously met with, how this approach would help people like myself who knew better. Wasn't there a concern that some might be dismayed and disillusioned by their church leader's lack of candor? They said, in essence, if a few people lose their testimonies over, it, over this, so be it. It's better than letting the true facts be known. Gordon B. Hinckley, do you teach that God was once a man? I wouldn't say that. There was a little couplet coined, as, God, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. Now that's more of a couplet than anything else. That gets into some pretty deep theology that we don't know very much about. Here's Gordon B. Hinckley standing for something with a Time Magazine interview. When I was in CES once, I, you know, I was in charge of, uh, of this group of region guys and, and their in-service and stuff. And uh, I was supposed to send out this information about a big area mid-year conference we were going to have. And everyone was, in, was instructed to read standing for something. And so I wrote this memo out to the ten guys that I was in charge of. Some were at seminary guys, some were institute. I said... Um, it suggested that we read the book and come ready to discuss Gordon B. Hinckley's standing for something. And I said, please, <laughs> please don't be fooled, because there's another book by President Hinckley's brother called Sitting for Nothing. <laughs> and so, <laughs> don't get the wrong book. So, you know, <laughs> stupid junior high humor. And uh, <laughs> if, it's, if it raises to that level, and then some guy contacted my area director who visited with me personally and said that that was demeaning to President Hinckley and that I should apologize to all the brethren in my area <laughs> because it might have misled some of them. So, <laughs> you know what? It was worth it. It was <laughs> sitting for nothing? That's funny. Okay. <laughs> Oh, man, I love it. I don't know that we teach it, same principle. I don't know that we emphasize it. I haven't heard it discussed for a long time in public discourse. I don't know. I don't know all the circumstances under which that statement was made. I understand the philosophical background behind it, but I don't know a lot about it, and I don't know that others know a lot about it. 
standing for something. 